The problem right now, or rather I should say the temptation, is that rather than deploying our finite investable income to buy more shares at lower prices this year, you've got young investors opting instead to use that income for a fixed return, the 9.62% that I-bonds are paying. And it feels like a psychologically safe move in the short term because we're locking in a return in a year where everything is candidly on fire. The unusual conditions that we're in right now have both people chasing performance and people chasing safety fleeing to the same asset, the I-bond. I fear personally that it's a bit of a distraction for young investors who would be better served in the long run loading up on relatively cheap shares while things are low. Welcome back to The Money with Katie Show, Rich Girls and Boys. I'm your host, Katie Yaddy Tossan, and this week we are talking about the flight to safety, aka how investors react when shit hits the fan. This episode was inspired by a little something you may have seen 498 headlines about so far. I bonds. I bonds. The secret weapon to fight inflation, the guaranteed return in a sea of red in your portfolios. As soon as the 9.62% rate for I-bonds was announced, my DMs were flooded with people asking me if I was buying some, how much they should buy, and what the catch was. I feel like I had never even heard of these things, and then suddenly it was all anyone could talk about. So today, I want to break down a few things. Number one, what the I-bond really even is. Number two, why I'm not buying any. And number three, who might want to buy some? So let's start with a quick, basic rundown. What is an I-bond? Before we can define the I-bond, we should probably gloss over the definition for bonds in general. Bonds are fixed income vehicles that typically act to complement stocks in your portfolio as the lower risk, lower volatility investment. You are effectively loaning money to the government or a corporation if you're buying corporate bonds and they're paying you interest on the loan. An I-bond specifically is issued by the U.S. Treasury and the intent is to help protect your money from inflation. The obvious notable caveat here is that the bonds are indexed to inflation, which means technically the real return, if we are to believe the CPI data, would actually be zero. If inflation is 9% and you get a 9% return on your I-bond, you're effectively just keeping your purchasing power the same, which isn't a bad thing to be sure, but I think we hear 9% return and we assume it's a real return of 9%, and that's not really true. It's a nominal return of 9%. I will add, however, that some people's personal rates of inflation may be a lot lower than 9% or higher, since 9% is the consumer price index inflation rate. Meaning, if you are buying the exact basket of goods that they are indexing to, yes, your rate is 9%. But if you're not, for example, if you don't drive very much, so you're not buying gas, and you own your own home, so you're not being subjected to rent inflation, and you don't buy many consumer goods, you may be experiencing a personal rate of inflation that's a lot less than 9%. Anyway, you have to buy these I-bonds directly from the U.S. Treasury at treasurydirect.gov, which is an online experience that's pretty much exactly what you would expect from a government-run website that looks like it hasn't been touched since 1993. But horrible UI UX aside, I-bonds have a few stipulations. You can only invest $10,000 per person per year, so a married couple could theoretically throw in $20,000 per year. Uh, if you get a tax refund, you can invest an additional amount of up to $5,000 of that refund. The rate changes every six months in May and November. So if you lock in 9.62%, you will receive that rate for six months. That is the annualized rate. To be clear, though, it's more like 0.77% per month for six months. And then it'll adjust based on the new inflation data. And last but not least, you have to hold it for a year to get your interest. And if you sell in less than five years, you give up the last three months of interest. The term on I-bonds is technically 30 years, so it's not explicitly designed to be a short-term store of value, though we're going to talk about it later in this episode as if it is. All right, so those are the basics, right? Now, understandably, people were losing their shit over bonds that paid 9% per year because we haven't seen anything like it since... Well, the 90s, if memory serves. 
So why am I not buying any? Why is Scrooge McDuck personal finance blogger not buying I-bonds? To me, whether or not someone should or should not be buying I-bonds comes down to one thing, asset allocation. If you are a young investor, so 20s, 30s, 40s even, and you have a 20, 30, 40 year timeline ahead of you, you are still in the early innings of this game, my friend. Your asset allocation should be primarily equities or other risk assets. You can define what feels risky for yourself. For example, I feel like real estate is risky. Others would say it's less risky. But if you're like me, you probably have a finite amount of income each year that you can devote to investing. You're not drawing from a bottomless well of cash for your investment decisions, right? You've probably got a few hundred bucks or if you're lucky, a few thousand bucks each month that you can invest. And this is why I fear the I-bond hype for young investors. To repeat the standard financial planning advice, most young people shouldn't have any more than 10% of their portfolio in bonds, assuming they have a relatively normal risk tolerance. Everyone's appetite for volatility and risk varies, so I can't make too many sweeping generalizations about this, but if I were to make one sweeping generalization, I'd say that most young investors don't need all that much bond exposure. Quite the contrary, actually. When you're young, historically, bear markets like the one we're in now are a blessing because it means every dollar you invest into said market will buy more shares of whatever you're purchasing than it did during the last bull market. At the time of this writing in July 2022, we are roughly 19% down from the beginning of the year, which means if I invested $100 into four shares at all time highs, right now that same $100 can buy roughly five shares of the exact same thing. And we talk about this a lot in investing, that if you just keep buying over time, regardless of what the market is doing, you will get the average market return. You'll buy when it's high, you'll buy when it's low, and your cost basis will average out. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but that's the basic premise of why dollar cost averaging into the market works and where the whole average return thing comes from. To state it explicitly, your return is determined in part by the stock market itself and in part by the price you pay for your shares. If you only ever bought shares during bull markets, your average returns would be paradoxically lower than someone who bought through bull and bear markets because they paid less for some of theirs. The problem right now, or rather I should say the temptation, is that rather than deploying our finite investable income to buy more shares at lower prices this year, you've got young investors opting instead to use that income for a fixed return, the 9.62% that I-bonds are paying. And it feels like a psychologically safe move in the short term because we're locking in a return in a year where everything is candidly on fire. But if we're diverting funds that we would have been investing in the bear market for our long-term returns to these short-term gains instead, we are no longer taking advantage of bear market prices. So to extend our earlier example, we just used our $100 to buy four shares when things were riding high, right? We're doing great. And then we didn't use our new $100 to buy five shares when shit is hitting the skids. The unusual conditions that we're in right now have both people chasing performance and people chasing safety fleeing to the same asset, the I-bond, which is really weird. I fear personally that it's a bit of a distraction for young investors who would be better served in the long run loading up on relatively cheap shares. They're not actually cheap, historically speaking, but compared to one year ago, they are cheap while things are low. I shared this sentiment on Twitter and one reply noted that we might not be at the bottom yet, which is true. We might not be, but that's the thing. Trying to wait for the bottom is just a euphemism for trying to time the market. And it means that we are not dollar cost averaging through the lows, which history tells us is how our biggest gains are made. So take this passage from Nick Majuli's blog of dollars and data. He wrote it during the March 2020 sell-off, but it still rings true. He says, nevertheless, there is a silver lining for investors who are buyers of equities right now. 
every dollar they invest in the current market environment will grow to far more than one invested in the months prior, assuming that the market eventually recovers. To demonstrate this, let's imagine you decided to invest $100 every month into U.S. stocks from September 1929 to November 1954. So this would be the 1929 crash and recovery. If you were to follow such a strategy, here's what $100 monthly payments would have grown to, including dividends and adjusted for inflation by the time U.S. stocks recovered in November 1954. And then he has this chart that shows the dollars that were invested during the crash itself had strikingly outsized performance. We will link the blog post in the show notes. He writes, the closer you bought to the bottom in the summer of 1932, the greater the long-term benefit of that purchase. Every $100 invested at the lows would grow to $1,200, which is three times greater than the growth of a $100 purchase made in 1930, which would have just grown to $400. So yes, the amounts in the chart that we will link in the show notes are biased because the Dow's price recovery took multiple decades, but he goes on to explore all the other major drawdowns and how much of a return premium you would have gotten if you invested through the drawdowns near the bottom. So right now at about 19% down year to date, every dollar that you put in is going to go further than it would have just a few months ago when we were at all time highs. And that is exactly why I fear the I-bond hype for young investors as a distraction from the long-term plan. Because with I-bonds, we will make a 9% guaranteed this year, but we're probably sacrificing way more in the long run in order to do it. My fear is some 23-year-old sees all the headlines about I-bonds and says, huh, well, I have my first 10000 to invest this year. I'm going to put it in I-bonds and have a 100% bond allocation instead of following through with my plan to invest it in the S&P 500 or the total stock market or insert any other index fund here. Your 20s are not the time to flee to fixed income. They are the time to get greedy when everyone else is fleeing to fixed income. That's why I haven't adjusted my investment strategy at all in response to the bear market or the new I-bond rates. And sure, I could identify my current bond exposure in my portfolio, cash out my current fixed income positions, and then plug that money into I-bonds to get my bond exposure there. But ultimately, that's a lot of selling, taxable events, and hassle to get what will amount to roughly $962 at most, since the maximum I can invest is $10,000, and we know the fixed rate is 9.62%. So why are we hearing about this now? Well, during drawdowns in the recent past, inflation wasn't as high, so we didn't even have this temptation to contend with. People do typically flee to fixed income and perceived safer assets during bear markets, but we haven't had a safer asset with this high of a return recently. But that does bring me to my next point, which is who might actually want to buy some of these and when it might make sense. So to throw it back to our earlier asset allocation conversation, here's the deal. If you have money sitting in a high yield savings account or in bonds already that you were hoping to use in 18 months to two years from now for some big purchase, and it does not represent money that you would have invested in equities anyway, then I think I-bonds might make sense. Even though, as we've noted, they aren't intended to be a short-term investment. But since you can get six to nine months of 9.62% on an I-bond, depending on when the rate changes and when you sell, it's preferable to the gains you would make in a high yield savings account that pay, I don't know, 0.5%. I want to caution you though, because I see your wheels turning. If you have your emergency fund sitting in cash thinking, huh, oh, well, I could always invest that pile of money. But if we are heading into a recession or honestly, even if we're not, but we're just still in a period of economic slowdown and general precariousness, locking up your cash for a year is likely not the best way to proceed on paper. But let's say you've got your eye on a new car or a new house or a life-sized wax replica of Money with Katie that you're going to install in your formal dining room as a dinner party conversation piece. I am happy to pose for this. And let's say you were planning to go after said purchase in late 2023 or early 2024. Well, now you might have a case for taking some of that cash and investing it in I-bonds instead. 
You'll still have to contend with the Treasury Direct website that was built using Microsoft Paint in the first iteration of JavaScript, but for an annualized 9.62% return on cash that would have been collecting dust in your Chase savings account anyway, it's probably worth the hassle. One other thing to note, you will be taxed federally at your marginal tax rate as if the interest is ordinary income. So you can expect to take mm, a 20% ish haircut, most likely on those gains, but Hey, it's still better than nothing. Realistically though, let's be real. If we're talking a married couple that has 20 K sitting in a house down payment fund for January, 2024, and they each decide to throw 10 K into I bonds and lock in six months of 9.62% and then six more months of, you know, let's assume it stays the same 9.62% again. And then they wait three more months. So they get a full year of interest before cashing out. It amounts to roughly $2,000 worth of gains. Let's say they are in the 24% tax bracket. So that eats up $480 in taxes and you've got about $1,500 of profit. If you are trying to buy a house and your down payment needs to be 50 K and you've got 20 K right now, at the end of the day, that $1,500 is not going to go very far. Not to say we wouldn't take it, but it's not life changing money, right? So all that to say, if you are itching to get your hands on some of these bad boys, go for it. But if you're not quite sold or you don't really want to hassle in the long run, you're not missing out on much because even the maximum potential gain after putting in the most you can for the next year is only about $1,500 after taxes, nothing to sneeze at, but likely nothing to lose sleep over either. We will be right back after a message from the sponsors of today's episode. Today's Money with Katie episode is brought to you by Caribou. You have surely noticed that the cost of literally everything is on the up and up. Uh, I've been constantly tinkering with my budget to account for extra spending on everything from our gas to our food while still hitting my savings goals. And it kind of feels like it's getting impossible to keep living your same life according to our old budgets and Big items in your budget are often a really good place to start. Enter Caribou. You can refinance your car through Caribou, especially if you had a high interest rate from dealership financing. Caribou helps you take control of your car payments. The application is super easy and you can even pre-qualify for loan offers without impacting your credit score or entering a social security number. Caribou customers save on average $100 a month on their car loan when they refinanced through Caribou. See how much you can save by checking your rate at caribou.com slash money with Katie. Terms apply. Visit caribou.com slash money with Katie for details. This episode of the money with Katie show is brought to you by QAI. I don't know about you, but I love a good theme, a space cowgirls bachelorette, a nineties themed birthday, a themed investment. That's right. You can give your investment strategy a good theme and make sure it understands the assignment with QAI. QAI offers investment kits that make it easy for you to invest in a single click based on your interests or economic trends. Their award-winning AI will automatically rebalance your trades for optimal performance. Investing with QAI is free. We love to hear it. And right now you can get a $100 bonus to your account funded with $100 or more. Sign up at refer.tryq.ai slash mbrew. That's refer.tryq.ai slash mbrew. All right, with that, let's welcome today's guest, Alan Ebright, the Director of Client Relationships at Hodges Private Client in Dallas, Texas. Alan and I became friends via email after a few exchanges about my blog posts, and he is joining us for the show today. As a reminder, though Alan works in finance, this is not professional financial advice. And there is a full disclosure notice in the show notes for anyone interested in diving headfirst into some very riveting legalese. But with that said, Alan, welcome to the Money with Katie show. Thanks for being hey, here. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. It's good to uh, finally talk to you in person. Yeah, absolutely. So, Alan, this episode is all about I bonds, which are, you know, this thing that I feel like I, I keep hearing about in the media ad nauseum. But in a broader sense, it's about investor behavior and psychological temptations. Why do most people underperform the index into which they have invested? Like, can you speak to the sentiment of, 
hey, things don't look great right now. I'm going to I'm going to wait in cash or I'm going to go do something that's a little bit safer until I feel better. Yeah. And it, trying to pinpoint why a lot of people don't match the performance of the S&P 500 as an example, it, it usually comes down to the temperament of the person. And what I think would be a good, a good thing to discuss first, and we use this as a framework for a lot of the podcast, is mm -hmm. um, if you go to Dalbar Inc. And Dalbar is a financial services market research firm. They're out of Massachusetts. They do this annual thing called the Quantitative Analysis of Investor Behavior. And what they do is, is they look at the trailing 30 year return on the S&P 500, which in the most recent 30 year iteration was from January of 92 through December of 2021. And the S&P returns something in the neighborhood like 10.6% annualized. But their statistical sampling of the individual investor came up with something that's right around 7.13 percent and so mm. yeah you sit here and go well wait a minute this should be easy i've pulled up a chart of the s p for the last 30 years really simple i'm going to contribute my 401k when i'm working and boom you know i'm 20 years old or 25 years old when i'm 55 60 i'm going to have plenty of money and it, it should be that easy but the reality is is that there come a lot of temptations along the way. And then when we get into volatility like we do now, it makes people rethink why well, I should do something different right now. So what role does comparison play in these decisions? I think that comparison is always something that you have to do when you're looking at options to put your money. And so the comparison going on with the I-bonds is, Wow, 9.6%. I'm looking at a down 20% S&P. Remind me what happened over the last six months because when we, when we yeah. ended 2021, it looked like this thing was just going to keep going. And no, we have get, uh, 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 you know, the Ukraine-Russia conflict, runaway inflation. Um, ah, what do I do now? It's that kind of, of fight or flight um, mechanism that all of us come hardwired with. And having these feelings is a, a normal human reaction, right? You wouldn't be human if you didn't experience some sort of emotion uh, along your investment mm -hmm. path, right? We're all um, subjected to that. But when you when you look at that analysis, and I'll give you some numbers here that I'm pulling straight off of, of the Dalbar site, is 100,000 invested in the S&P 500 in 1992 was worth a little over 2 million at the end of last year. Oh my God. Incredible, right? So that is you put 100,000 in 30 years ago, you didn't contribute anything to it, it should have spit out a result that was a little over 2 million. The average investor, ended up with 789,000. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> that really hurts. Okay, yes. And I think we've been harping on this idea a lot here in Money with Katie World, which is that it's very easy to say, oh, I'll definitely stay the course. Yeah, I just dollar cost average in. What, you know, what could be easier? It's easy to do that when things are going up. And then the second you are down 20% and there is this alternative that's, you know, a guaranteed 9.62% rate of return. It's like, oh, well, but what if I just deviated from the course a little bit? And I don't think that that's to say that diversification isn't a good thing. But if you are reacting to the market being down by changing your approach or your strategy, then that's fundamentally a little bit different. So can you talk about your perspective on the proper level of diversification for a young investor who's got a long investing lifetime ahead of them, like hopefully 30 years or more? Right. So, you know, time is on your side as an investor, right? You take a certain amount of money, you put it to work in the equity market, you let it do its thing and you're rewarded over time. So if, if uh, you know, you're in your 20s, you're in your 30s, even in your 40s, you're probably gonna be working till you're in your mid to late 60s. 
And, you know, time and time again, equities over the long term have been a really good way to compound your money. And I would tell people that use these corrections uh, to your advantage. And, and humorously, you need to kind of flip it around and how you look at a correction. So pick your favorite, you know, store that you shop at. I'm not talking about a grocery store or Target you know, something that has pretty expensive clothes or shoes or something like that. If, if, Chanel. There you go. <laughs> Chanel, which probably never goes on sale. But for the sake of the argument, um, you know, if you saw Chanel uh, having a 10% off sale, you'd make a mental note. Next time you're at the mall, you'll probably drop by. If you saw a 20% off sale, you'd probably go that week. And if Yep, making a special yeah. trip. No doubt, this is number one thing we're going to do this week is, is hit the Chanel store. But if you saw 30 to 40%, you would probably leave skid marks in your driveway beating <laughs> everybody to the store. <laughs> right? Oh, and so, I love it. Right. And we don't take that approach with equity. We don't. We look at it and we go the other way. We go, oh my God, it's down 30%. Uh, you know, uh that to somebody who is in their accumulation phase is should be welcomed that's when you you want yeah. to to definitely stay the course if you haven't been maxing out your 401k and you can afford to do so that's a perfect time to start maxing it out if you mm -hmm. have other money that you've kind of earmarked for investment not big ticket purchases that would be another time to to start to step in uh, so use those downturns to your advantage. Yeah. So on that note, anything else you would say right now to someone who is tempted to scrap the whole plan and, and try to stop the bleeding? You can't do it. You have to kind of fight that, that little thing inside of you that might say, uh, we're, the market's down. We don't know what's going on. There's a midterm election coming. The Fed really can't seem to even get it straight on how long this inflation thing's mm -hmm. going to last. I get it. There's a lot of negative news going on right now. So intuitively, it's like, boy, 9.6%. I better jump over here and try some of that. There's nothing wrong with taking a portion of your money and doing that. But I think your question about scrapping the whole thing, that is that is something that I would not recommend anybody do at junctures like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, totally. I think um, the, the one group that I have kind of conceded that might make sense or be a good, you know, a good customer for an I-bond would be somebody that was going to hold that money in cash anyway and wanted the money a year to 18 months from now. Um, other than that, I can't really think of somebody else or some other reason why at, you know, 25, 35, I mean, even into your 40s, if you have a long time horizon ahead of you still, that it would really make sense to deviate very strongly from the, the predetermined course particularly because you likely only have a predefined amount of income this year to invest. And if you choose to pursue something safer and not invest in these in, in, through a bear market, well, you know, there will be a long-term cost associated with that. So any, any last words on I bonds, Alan, anything else you'd want to no, add? I think you've, you've summed that up correctly. You know, something that's going to give you a little bit of yield like that, that's, that's above and beyond a lot of what other yields you can find out there. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, you know, the math that you kind of went through, um, that's something to be aware of, too, right? These, these different fixed income instruments sometimes have a lot of things. You have to read the fine print on them with respect to redemptions mm -hmm. and interest rate crediting and all of that. So, um, you know, kind of look before you take that leap of faith, right? Yeah. And man, that website, treasurydirect.gov, does not make it easy to take that leap of faith. They really, they, they put all the friction in there for you. So if this episode didn't give you pause, I think the user experience of the government website probably will. Rich Girl Roundup. Yeah. Love it. All right, everybody, to close us out this week, we've got another Rich Girl Roundup. 
As a reminder, we will take listener questions every month. I'll put a call for questions on Instagram. So follow Money with Katie on Instagram if you're not already, shameless plug. And we will pick one that feels interesting and widely applicable and we'll answer it. As my standard disclaimer, I am not a licensed financial professional. This is not financial advice. This is just what would Katie do if she were you? This segment is brought to you by Betterment, giving you the tools, inspiration, and support you need to become a better investor. Here's this week's question from Mary. What's the exact difference between financial planners, consultants, and advisors? What should a good financial resource be able to do for me, and how much should each of these cost? This is a great question and likely a pretty popular one. The amount of designations and licenses in the financial services industry is plentiful, way too many to name. And it can be hard to decipher between them since there are confusing and sometimes interchangeable terms thrown around that can mean a lot of different things. So this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I'll run through a few of the popular ones and some ways to think about this. So You've probably heard the term financial advisor, which could mean someone who has a CFP designation, meaning they're a certified financial planner. It's a very comprehensive exam. Or someone who primarily makes their income from selling high commission insurance products, meaning they're more of a broker dealer. Which, to be fair, insurance sales is a valid job, but it is tricky for the consumer when their job title obscures that fact. And while they do have a duty to do it suitable for you, it's a lower standard and they mostly make money if you buy insurance and other commission products. So there is a bit of a conflict of interests. You've also got the CPA realm. So think accountants. I think this raises the first important question that you want to be asking yourself, which is what type of help do you want? Do you want someone who can prepare your taxes for you? Do you want someone who's going to do full service financial planning? Someone to manage your investments for you in an ongoing way? Do you want someone to make you a financial plan one time that you can then execute yourself? The answer to these questions will help inform what type of help is right for you. If you need it at all, which brings me to the crux of my answer, which is if you have a lot of money and I'm going to go out on a limb and say multiple seven figures and you have complexities with taxes and trusts and real estate and businesses or complicated streams of income, it probably makes sense to hire a fiduciary financial advisor with a CFP designation from a firm that has CPAs on staff who can help you manage that. If you have less than a million dollars, I would say it's probably less worth it, but that's a personal judgment call. I just don't think professional help is necessary for your average person with a W-2 job and a straightforward situation, particularly the average person who listens to personal finance podcasts and likely has the basics down. So you may decide that you really would like somebody to be involved so that you can be completely hands off, even if you don't have seven figures in the bank and you might think that the extra costs are worthwhile to you. But that brings me to my final point, which is how you pay. Ideally, you would pay via a fee-only model, wherein you are charged by the hour or by the plan, as opposed to an assets under management model, also known as AUM, where the firm or person responsible for your money is paid a seemingly small percentage of your net worth every single year, regardless of whether your assets are up or down. And it can be quite high. So it's good to ask if you are thinking of pursuing that route. Uh, fees have been generally trending down, but I would be wary of anything much over 0.5% because at that point, it's going to start to compound quickly. I would avoid a 1% fee like the plague, but that's just me. Simply because it is very difficult for someone to provide a commensurate amount of value for the amount you will be paying them over time as that 1% fee compounds. I think NerdWallet actually did a study that estimated the average millennial paying a 1% fee will pay between $500,000 and $600,000 in fees over their lifetime. So it's just something to be cautious of. You can find a fee-only advisor with the NAPFA database if you're interested. It's the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. We will link that in the show notes. But my TLDR on this entire answer is unless you have a pretty complex situation or a lot of money, you probably don't need professional help yet. 
All right, y'all, that is all for this week. Before we go, comment below what you thought the most interesting part of our conversation was, and remember to like and subscribe to our channel. I will see you next week, same time, same place on The Money with Katie Show. Our show is a production of Morning Brew and is produced by Nick Torres and me, Katie Gowdy Tossin. Sarah Singer is our VP of Multimedia, and additional content editing comes from our lovely senior editor, Hannah Velez. Our fabulous video producer is Christy Muldoon, and Sam Cat is our VP of Chaos, while JoJo Beans is our chief of woof, barking at any passerby, regardless of how well the recording is going. Mm-hmm.